1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. The Chaplain's Report today, I don't want to delve too far into the realm of politics because I do want to keep the Chaplain's Report primarily based on the scripture, but I did want to mention that, of course, today is tax day. It is April 15th. And, of course, we all know that that's the day where we have to pay our taxes. But I noticed a trend on Twitter's hashtag for tax day. And it's something that I've, I've noticed for some time now. Uh, I just scrolled through it, and, and one thing that I noticed is that people that tended to lean left, when they were talking about tax day, they were talking about how evil it was and, and unfair it was and how all the tax breaks that were brought about by the Trump administration were just brought about to help rich people, even though everybody got pretty much the same level of tax cut. It was all pretty much 2%. It was a little bit more than others based on your tax bracket, but overall it was about a 2% cut for everybody. But they were always using these subjective numbers for it. In other words, they were saying that X amount of people are unhappy with the new tax system or X amount of people oppose tax cuts for the wealthy. Again, despite the fact that the tax cuts really affected every tax bracket. But nonetheless, it was always something subjective. Now, on the right, a lot of the people that were talking about it talked about objective numbers. In other words, they were giving new job numbers and job numbers since the tax cuts went through and how much better business is doing and how much better the economy is doing. Something that's concrete and real and substantial. I'm not saying that people's feelings don't matter. I'm just saying that when you compare it to hard facts of how well a system is working as opposed to how well people feel about how it's working, those are two entirely separate things. And the same is true for the scripture. The same is true for the Bible. Because there are a lot of people that don't feel good about certain verses. There are a lot of people that don't feel good about certain parts of the Bible. Generally, the parts that include them doing something that they don't like. And that could be anything from, you know, being baptized and dedicating your life to Christ and foregoing all of your sinful urges and, and even sometimes your innocent urges if they interfere with your connection with God. Or things like loving your enemy, things that are very difficult for people to do and they don't want to spend much time on that because they know how hard it is to actually accomplish it. But nonetheless, there is a tendency to do this with Scripture. There is a tendency to avoid things that we don't like. There is a tendency to avoid obeying God when it is something that is unpopular for us to have to do. But you know, this is not something that is new to mankind. And I'm so grateful that the Bible has a habit of telling us that the problems that we have and the issues that we take with one another they're really not that new. They've kind of been around for a really long time. And this problem is no different. In fact, specifically relating to taxes, let's look at Matthew 22, 17 through 22. And for whatever reason, my graphics aren't working, so I'm going to have to just read this to you. Matthew 22, 17 through 22, if you want to open up your Bible and read along. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me a coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Now this is one of those occasions where the Pharisees came to give Jesus a question, and they weren't really concerned with the answer. They were really trying to trap him in a situation that he couldn't win regardless of what he said, and this is no different. See, they were thinking, okay, well, if he says that we shouldn't pay the tax, then all we have to do is tell the Roman officials, hey, this is, guy is a religious teacher, and he's telling people not to pay taxes. And yes, Romans do take that very seriously. That would be the 
equivalent to him inciting a riot or breaking up the peace, and then Rome would intervene and take care of their Jesus problem. They wouldn't have to deal with Jesus anymore because the Romans would deal with him. If he answers the other way, and he says, well, you should pay your taxes, then all they have to do is go to the Jews and say, see, this Jesus guy, he's not about overthrowing Rome. He's saying that you should just bow down and kiss the feet of your Roman masters. And so either way, they won. They either have Rome going after him, or they have him less popular amongst the Jews. Either way, they can use his response as a weapon. And then Jesus does something that they do not expect, which is take a third option. Explain to them why they should pay their taxes. And the way that that chapter continues on, if you look at the very next verse that we didn't get a chance to read, it says that they went away, which I kind of picture in my head, and maybe it's just me, but like a mic drop moment, that as soon as Jesus answers, the Pharisees are just like, oh, well, there's not really a good response to that, so let's just walk away. <laughs> I mean, I picture it as there being no discussion after that, that they just walked away immediately after. But anyway, that's the thing about this, is that the they were hung up on trying to trap Jesus, and because of that, they didn't see the obvious answer. And the reason that this answer is so profound is because Jesus goes back to a very real but very simple fundamental truth, which is there are certain powers in existence that God has put into place. And as long as we are following God and there is not a law that contradicts God's law, we are to follow that to the best of our ability. It makes us better neighbors and better followers of God because we can better represent his kingdom here on earth. But I want you to notice how he answered that and the explanation that he gave. He said, give me a coin. And then he looks at the coin and sees that Caesar's inscription on it and asks them to, to repeat that for him. And follows that up with saying, well, then give to Caesar what is rightfully his and also give to God what is rightfully his. You see, Caesar's inscription was on the coin. Then the question becomes, okay, well, whose inscription is on us? And the answer should be obvious. It's God. We're made in his image. We are created of him. Our life, our light, our intellect, everything that we have comes from the almighty creator. And if that's the case, if Caesar is the one that commissioned those coins, and it is by his authority that the Roman tax collectors collect those coins as a tax, then doesn't it make sense that something that is made in the image of God, that is given his inscription and his likeness, and that the whole institution of humanity comes from him, just like the institution of Roman currency came from the emperor, that God has a certain level of authority over us that we ought to observe and that we ought to adhere to? You see, if we're adhering to the advice that Jesus is giving here, sure, with our physical governments who institute currency, we are expected to obey and be obedient as much as we can and still follow God's word. And that's an institution that God himself set up and wants us to be good citizens of our nation. But ultimately, he also wants us to remember that if we're rendering to God the things that are his, that means the government may get our money and they may have a certain level of loyalty that's expected of us, but God should get our everything. God should have our absolute loyalty because at the end of the day, it's his inscription that's on us. We belong to him. And we need to live a life that reflects that truth. Everything that we do, everything that we are, needs to be dedicated to him every day. And no, we're not going to reach that goal, and it's something that's, that's very lofty and difficult for a flawed human being to accomplish. But that should be what we should be working on every day. And if we do that and we continue to strive to be the kind of Christian, to live in the image of Christ and to follow his example, then we will be rendering unto God that which is his. Stay the course, friends. Hey, to make sure you get all the updates, you need to go ahead and subscribe and click that little notification bell down there. That gets you a notification every time I post a new Bible lesson or political commentary. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't subscribe, it's because you hate America and Jesus, but I can't think of any other reason you wouldn't subscribe.